On today's JDM Masters Car Reviews, we have the Honda S2000. Now, a lot of misconception about what VTEC is when people say uh, that VTEC kicks in. The F20C yes. is a short stroke engine, which means low center of gravity. The F20B and the C, F20C, two liter, Honda had never produced a rear wheel drive car flow out like that, but the original one. <laughs> Look at the rivals here. Mazda Roadster NB, Mercedes SLK, Z3, and Porsche Boxster. Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of JDM Masters Car Reviews. And today we have the Honda S2000, which is one of the last true 90s JDM classics. And we're gonna be taking a look at what makes this car special. So come join us. So the car we have here today in bright yellow uh, belongs to our friend Albo and you can see here from the previous video that we went to see this car at the used shop and we did a little assessment of it and so he actually bought it and it's here today. So thank you Albo for letting us review your car. So let's start off first with a bit of facts. The Honda S2000 was manufactured between 1999 and all the way up to 2009. Now that 10 year shelf life that was on sale is actually quite long if you were to talk about cars like the Civic or the Accord, uh, normal passenger cars which usually in Japan has a four year cycle but it's quite normal for a sports car. Uh, if you look at the NSX it was on sale from 1990 to 2005 which means it was 15 years but one of the reasons why this car was so popular along fans all around the world that it just stood the test of time in terms of design. Now, one of the reasons why it was so popular, or rather why did Honda keep it in production for such a long time, was that it made various small improvements over the course of time. Now, unlike cars like the STI or the Lancer Evolution, where uh, it was a clear distinctive evolution of each year model, in reality, in Japan at least, the S2000 had as much as six or seven variables. And if you look at the model code called AP, followed by a 1 or a 2, so the 1 signifies that it's got an F20C 2-litre engine and the AP2 signifies that it's got the 2.2-litre F20C. Now, a little trivia here. In 2003, Honda upgraded the 2-litre to the 2.2-litre for the American market, but actually kept the AP1 designation 2 liters, although it did get a facelift and they kept it until 2005 before they introduced the 2.2 liter ending a couple of years later with the final type s so they'd made incremental changes and this is designated by the number code after the ap so this 1999 and 2000 version starts with 100 and then it goes 110 120 and so on now let's look into why honda before they made this car was typically known for being a specialist in front-wheel drive sports cars. You had the Civic, the Integra, and the Prelude. And of course, that crazy supercar called the NSX that was derived from their dream to create a supercar that beat Ferrari 
and Porsche back all the way in the late 80s. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about what was basically a spiritual successor to their first sports car called the S500. It was followed by the 600 and the 800. The name S in the S2000 comes from that. The 2000 is supposed to signify two things. The initial 2000cc capacity, like the S500, 600, 800, but also it was Honda's 50th birthday gift to themselves, celebrating 50 years of the company's history and to reach a new, new car for the 21st century, for the year 2000. So let's go a little bit back into 1995 when they came up with this concept called the Sports Study Model or the SSM. Now the SSM was shown at the Tokyo Motor Show in 1995 as a concept for what was their vision of an F1 car in rear wheel drive FR platform. Now this was already coming from the experience making that mid-engine supercar, the NSX, and a lot of people probably wouldn't be able to afford an NSX. Like in Japan, it was uh, set at the price of 10 million yen, perhaps much more overseas, and that's like three or four times the price of a Civic or an Integra Type R. Honda wanted to create a new generation sports car, something they've never done before that was more affordable to the common man, but also it was a culmination and a collection of all their various technologies into something very, very special. Now, coming from the SSM concept model, Honda knew exactly that they wanted to make an FR, front-engine, rear-wheel drive platform together with a convertible or a cabriolet-style car. Obviously, this is coming from the S500, 600, 800 tradition, but also something that they had never produced before. Now, up to that point, you have to understand that Honda had never produced a rear-wheel drive car, minus the NSX, of course, but that, like, a front engine rear wheel drive and in the midst of the competition with rivals like the Mazda MX-5, the Nissan Silva and various other rear wheel drive cars from other manufacturers, Honda being Honda coming with the history of racing technology and uh, in F1 and just the company having its own quirky kind of thinking needed to do something very very special and in the Honda tradition they decided that they would make something contemporary but yet very very different under the skin. So now let's have a look at how they actually came to developing this particular model. In 1997 after the SSM concept, Honda brought their prototype to the Nürburgring and also to the Swiss mountain roads and they spent a whole year and a half just testing up to 30,000 kilometers up and down on practical roads because they knew that they wanted this to be a successful world car not just for the Japanese market but also for the American market, and most importantly, the European market. It had to compete with the likes of the Porsche Boxster, the BMW Z3, the MGF Roadster, and various other contemporary European cars. And it had to do better than all their rivals, just as how the NSX managed to topple the mid-engine Ferrari in 1990 and also the Porsche. So this was Honda's aim. If they had to do something, they had to do it better. And all that development led into what was the final form as you see here. Now the man who was put in charge of this project is an engineer called Shigeru Uehara. Now, fittingly of course because this gentleman also was responsible for the Integra Type R DC2 and the NSX. So Honda doesn't have that many sports cars. What better way to uh, make the next generation sports car from 1990 than this man? Now, interestingly, Uehara-san drew his inspiration for the S2000 from two different concepts. One was the F1 car that had the engine in front, and the other, to, as a flesh out to that very concept, was actually a Caterham 7, as you can see here. Low center of gravity, uh, sitting low and wide, with the driver almost at the rear wheels, and lightweight. This was actually his original concept for an inspiration for for this car. And looking at the final form from the original, as you can see here, uh, this is the SSM. It's not really different, except for a little redesign around the headlights, but the whole basic concept stays the same. Now, the other inspiration that Uehara-san had was from Honda's first F1 car, the RA272. So he knew it had to look nice, it had to also sit low, 
and it also had to have overall credentials and design and technology taken from Honda's F1 menu of engine parts that somehow put into a production ready road car. Now you could see that they had really high expectations for themselves and also what they wanted to give their customers. Honda was not content with just making their own version of the MX-5 or the Z3 Roadster, basing on all the technology they had up to that point and also to explore new unheard of technology, they needed to make sure that this car stood out against their rivals and exceeded everything beyond. So there are several things that made this possible. So Master, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Um, Elbo can't be with us on the drive today. Uh, but, yeah, unfortunately. We, yeah, we have another session with him mm -hmm. uh, later in the night. But um, the reason why you're here yes. is because you also considered buying an S2000. In fact, you were the one who introduced or persuaded Elbo <laughs> to persuaded. get into the S2000. You rented a AP2 Type S. Yes, exactly. And you, you guys fell in love with it. Yeah. Tell me why you like this car. So, when I first uh, borrowed S2000, I initially thought it was just a cool car, so I just wanted to, you know, enjoy driving it. But more and more I pushed the car, the more and more I really fell in love with with, the, with this open top experience, this really crispy and short six-speed manual, and this awesome S2AC engine. It made me just fell in love with the car. Now, interestingly, you were thinking of buying one. Yes. But it turns out now yes. you bought another type of Honda, which um, we'll won't we'll save that surprise for you viewers. Uh huh. What Honda um, Master is bought. Yeah. So you've driven this also. Yes. Also compared to the AP2. What do you think of the differences? Oh, actually, it's a lot. Um, so when I first drove AP2, I thought it was really a good car because like when you're not pushing the car, it feels, it felt really, um, actually felt decent torque on the lower end. Right. When what, once it gets to, you know, VTEC, which is around like 6,000, it really kicks in. So I thought really a good car, but this car, to be honest, from 5,000 RPM to below, like below you know, on a, a gauge cluster, nothing. It's actually it, from 5,000 to below, it's really slower compared to AP2, in my opinion. But of course, the 2-liter engine, the F20C, has a very nice characteristic. Now, the F20C yes. is a short stroke engine, which means it's an over-square design. Yes. Something like the B60A and B60B. Mm -hmm. The F20C is a long stroke design. Yes. So, just by um, design, it cannot rev as high as the 2 liter. It mm -hmm. revs all the way to 9,000 RPM. Most of its power is in the upper band. Yeah. So it's it really gives that kind of race car kind of feeling. And that was, you know, worth, like, I mean, it's not a cheap car. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, selling price in Japan was 3.8 million yen, even with the uh, basic options. That made it actually almost 800,000 yen more expensive than the Lancer Evolution 6 oh, STI. Compared to the DC2 Integra Type R, yes. which was priced at 2.2 million, mm -hmm. the S2000 wasn't a cheap car. I put it in almost the same thing as an RX-7 FD, to be honest. Yes. And um, all of that, I mean, like, buyers must, must have been thinking, like, why are they paying so much of money for what was, you know, an FR car mm -hmm. with no turbo? Yes. And as we can see from the uh, technical and technological, sorry, we can see from the technology uh, put into the high exponent frame chassis, the inbuilt double boom spoke suspension, and this is just the engine itself just derived from, you know, Honda's racing heritage and F1 thing is basically very close to a racing engine for the road. Now at first glance, it just may look like a contemporary or normal cabriolet. You know, you've got a long bonnet, you've got two seats and a folding roof and it's pretty short. 
In fact, it does kind of resemble uh, the Mazda MX-5 in a lot of way in terms of proportion. But let's go down and look at the lines from the boot cutting across to a very, very low bonnet line. And you can also see how the spacing between the top of the fender is actually pretty close to the top of the bonnet line, much more so than our contemporary roadsters or convertibles uh, back in the late 90s. And it was this point that gave the S2000 its unique look. In fact, if you come over, you can see how wide the front fenders are and how low the bonnet line is. And sitting in here, the engine and the drivetrain push all the way down to the floor and back. It gives it its low center of gravity, which is one of the important points for their design. Of course, the MX-5 had these points as well, but the S2000's design went even further and creating a very sloping bonnet line, cutting off in the front like this. If you look from the bonnet line curving over the fender and how the bumper actually sort of wedges into this sharp nose, it really resembles a F1 car like on the road, of course, without the front, front splitters and front spoilers. This was what they wanted to, and also perhaps contributing to aerodynamic efficiency. And if you go to the side here, the coefficient drag, really, and if you look at the f uh, how the curvature from the bonnet line goes all the way over the long bonnet, sweeping over the windscreen, and it's pretty quite self-explanatory how aerodynamic uh, the design is. When you have the top up, the space between the rear seats and the back of the boot is also at a higher line, so the boots are actually raised, but then sloping down, and even without the optional wing, the third brake light is kind of worked into a sort of gentle wicker spoiler that feeds air upwards. And even the lines here, how there's a curvature uh, starting high and going low, and there's just so many gentle creases and curves on the body design that in my opinion, actually stands out even today. It doesn't look dated at all in 2020. Let's have a look at the rear light. This car doesn't have the original tail lights. This is an aftermarket light, uh, which kind of gives it a very modern design. Maybe it looks like an Audi or a BRZ. Anyway, it lights up. So yeah, the lights kind of flow out like that. But the original one <laughs> looks like that. <laughs> so the AP, the AP1 preface lift had two circle lamps and the later face diversion had three circle lamps, but I think either is okay. Look at the rivals here. Mazda Roadster NB, Mercedes SLK, Z3, and Porsche Boxster. Notice how high the fender line is in each of these contemporary cars in the 90s, and how low the S2000s one is. And somehow the space between the front the rear of the wheel arch and the door is also a lot wider and there's a reason for this. So a little further about the design concept and market placement of the S2000. Here's a chart that shows four variables. On this side here you have luxury, here we have agility or lightweight feeling, over here we have spartanness and if an F1 car is right in this corner the S2000 sits closer towards being a bit more spartan and having a lot more stability while being in the light wickets, away from the luxury cars such as the Mercedes and the BMW. And here sits the Roadster MX-5, the Lotus Elise and the Caterham Super 7 up here. So it's very clear, uh, the, and the boxes sit somewhere here, it's very clear that the S2000 was very, very much designed for a sporty and very kind of raw kind of, raw kind of feeling uh, all the way uh, from the design concept. Now, in order for Honda to fulfill their expectation of what they dreamt to be the perfect FR car, which is also a convertible. Now, generally, convertibles made from a sedan body, uh, very much like the, uh, the BMW or the Mercedes series, usually because the lack of a roof would mean that the body or the chassis structure would be significantly weaker and less torsional rigidity than an equivalent closed roof car. But Honda was not satisfied with that. So in order to make a convertible 
that was as strong as a closer body, they came up with some very interesting technologies. And right here you can see in this diagram is what is known as the high X-bone chassis. And if you look at these yellow parts over here, you can see how the front frame connects to this uh, very thick and large and rather high center tunnel and all the way to the back. This yellow part um, forms the X shape. And this diagram over here shows that this dotted line is where the floor line of conventional uh, cabriolets uh, usually have. Therefore, the body rigidity is only relying on the floor. This solid line here is the line that goes almost straight and a very high position, which gives the basic structure, uh, low center of gravity, but also very, very stiff. And you can actually see it here. So inside this high center console, uh, center tunnel, is this structure here. It's beautifully covered by the, the trim, but really it goes right to the back and also to the front. The side sills were also made extra thick. And you can really see it right here. In order to make this structure uh, meet 21st century safety standards and rigidity, uh, they actually went through a lot of testing and a lot of development. And basically this entire chassis had to be handmade in the same factory as the NSX, which we're gonna talk about in a bit. Okay. Also what makes the S2000 so expensive and so unique, it's not produced like a conventional mass production car like the, like the MX-5 normal factory line alongside other models. Where was this S2000 produced? So the factory was called Takanezao, which is located in Tochigi, but now they don't, the plant doesn't exist anymore. Oh. Some of the body panels for S2000, especially the floor panels, were welded by hand. Actually, oh wow, yeah, that's interesting. it's pretty interesting. Consider that all all those other manufacturers, every like the panel stitches were made by robots, essentially. Oh, I see. Uh, because of the specific design of the high X bone frame chassis and the wide side sills, mm -hmm. uh, even though it was steel. Yes. Um, no, to, to weld that aluminium body of the NSX, they had to actually develop special machines which weren't in existence in the industry at that time. At yes. Very high voltage and very high temperatures. Mm -hmm. But what did they do to manufacture the steel body of this car? So, when you weld the NSX, you know, uh, aluminum body, you need that power. But if you use that in a um, steel body, all those steel, the, the stitch points are gonna melt. Oh, so that's right. why the, the Takanizawa plant actually made special only for S2000, you know, welders just to produce S2000. Right, 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 right. All this contributed to very high production costs, explaining um, its high selling price. Mm -hmm. The S2000 suspension is derived very much from the NSX supercar using double wishbone front and rear. But another unique thing about the double wishbone suspension used on the S2000 is that it's an in-wheel type where the upper A-arms are actually, the whole assembly is inside the wheels, very much like the Toyota Supra and also the Mazda RX-7 and the MX-5. The rear suspension, this is the front, you can see it's inside with the uh, tie rod, steering tie rod here. This is the rear with uh, three links on the, on the bottom, no trailing arm. Also, it's in wheel and the gas dampers for the rear has a separate reservoir, uh, very much like uh, something used in much higher end cars. The rear suffering that also houses the rear differential and the Torsen LSD, which is the same type used by Toyota for its linearity, uh, is also pretty different in design and a bit complicated uh, even by modern day standards. But back in the late 90s, Honda really tried a lot of different ways and something very unique. Um, there's a lot of bushings to hold the rear differential from both sides. This is the diagram of the Torsen LSD, which is a type B type. And it has these gears which uh, push torque to the wheel that needs it the most. So typically 
uh, a Torsen LSD sensors torque and sends it to the, the wheel usually which is the outside wheel when the car is turning. Overall dimensions of the S2000 uh, isn't actually very very big. At 4.1 meters long it's almost the same length as the Civic Type R EK9 but its wheelbase is much shorter at 2.4 meters. That's 200 millimeters. That's 200 less than the Civic. Of course, being a rear wheel drive car, um, it's possible to have the wheelbase a little bit shorter for that extra agility. JDM version of the F20C, and we're gonna see in a minute, is very different from the American or the European versions. We can see from here, this is the compression ratio at 11.7 versus the export spec of uh, 11.5 I think and it gives 250 horsepower or PS at 8,300 is really really high and we're going to talk about the highlights of this particular engine. So Albo's car is not 100% stock it has the modulo optional front lip but the wheels are not stock they are 17 inch Ray's ZE40 at 7, 215 70. that's a great up closer to the AP2 spec um, the AP1 had 16 inch on the rear. It's also wider, but at 235 instead of 245, 40, 17. This is going to get better tires than this. Um, inside are Buddy Club suspension, cool coilovers, and there's a Cusco rollover bar, which adds uh, a bit more security and stability to the already quite good um, rollover bar hoops from the factory. And as I mentioned, on the rear there are aftermarket tail lights, which are much more modern. It's a bit smoked here. And also he has the Mugen exhaust system. Now this is a direct straight system and not the loop like it's found on the older uh, Civics uh, for the B engine and the H engine also. Other than that, uh, the car is pretty much stock on the, in terms of engine power and even the ECU. Oh, and there's also a Cusco two-way mechanical LSD, which makes it really tight in the cornering. So uh, all these additions are something that he always wanted. And it's also something that uh, a lot of S2000 owners do uh, before they take the car to the track or a bit more serious driving. The power plant of the S2000 is what makes it a world-class beater back in 1999. Here is the cross diagram of the F20C 2-litre four-cylinder engine with twin cam VTEC. Now, of course, VTEC, as a lot of Honda fans or JDM fans might know, is some magic valve system that gives much more power without the use of a turbo. But what is actually VTEC? Now, a lot of misconception about what VTEC is when people say uh, that VTEC kicks in, uh, it switches from a lower power to a higher power, but in actual fact, Honda's VTEC engine was designed from the outset to have a very specific high output uh, per capacity and the VTEC mechanism basically utilizes a lower speed cam to make it more drivable at city speeds and also to give it more low-end torque. Now this comes from their racing technology and experience in F1 and also with racing engines. But we're not going to talk too much about that today. Now the F20C engine was the fifth in their line of twin cam VTEX before the K28. The first, of course, being the C30 series from the NSX, the B16A from the Integra XXI and the Civic, and the B18C in the Integra and Integra Type R, and the B16B in the Civic Type R. And also not forgetting the very famous H22 engine. That H22 engine was also existed as an F series, and this is what it is. Called the F20C, it's actually based loosely on this engine here in this JDM Accord SIR uh, called CF4 right here. You can see here it says F20B. The F20B is actually based on the H22 engine. Now these, the H22 and the F engine is basically almost the same in terms of design, but this is a two liter. The only similarities between the F20B and the C are the bore spacings and the overall dimensions. In the blue is the F20B from the Accord. That's the front view, and this is the side view. You can see how much smaller the F20C was made. Now, the big difference 
is also in the engine block. Now something very interesting about the design of the engine box, the Honda is very well known to have absolute precision and uh, using their extensive F1 technology to make engines. And so we're starting with the block, in the previous B-series it used cast iron cylinders but for the F20C in order to make it lighter they use what they call FRM which is actually called MMC. MMC is called, it's not Mitsubishi Motors, it stands for um, metal matrix compound which is a process of lining the cylinder walls with a composite fiber in order to give it its strength but also makes it lighter. This process was used on the NSX C series engine and also the H22 engine but not for the B series but because the actual weight of the block coming from this heavy H engine was bigger in order to make it a more reliable two liters they turned to this technology and another interesting addition is this part right here. This is a ladder frame chassis that you can see here in the reference video from Best Motoring uh, at Spoon. They explain how this is a very important part that affixes to the bottom of the block in order to reduce vibrations, enables this engine to rev to almost 9,000 RPM. That's crazy if you think about it. The actual rev cut is 8,900 RPM, not 9,000 RPM like in marketing material. For a production engine in 1999, this was unheard of, even territory that Ferrari engines uh, could not reach. So the JDM version is 250 horsepower, making it 125 PS per litre, which is, was the highest output for any engine in the world at that time. It was only beaten by the Ferrari 458 Italia um, 10 years later. So let's learn about what are the things that went into making this. Now, the engine was a big step up from the B18C and the B16B. Everything from the design of the pistons to the skirt, uh, the, sm the small end bearings to the, the end of the crankshaft. As you can see, it also a redesign of the VTEC mechanism, uh, hollow camshafts, um, roller rocker arm system, um, lightened valves and hand ported intakes which is the same process used also in all the type r engines so this was a very bespoke engine with all the best of honda's racing and sports car technology this is also explains why the engine head cover is red even though the s2000 is not a type r red engine heads were only used previously on type r models but the red engine cover which is also using the prelude type s and the SIOS spec as well as the Euro R signifies that it's the highest output spec of that engine family. So it was a Type R type of engine mated with an open high rigidity body structure. Now let's have a look also another interesting thing about the cylinder head. Here's the intake and there's the exhaust cam sprocket. It's using a chain over the belt but it's not going over these two traditionally. It has a third cam sprocket run off the crankshaft and also to the oil pump, making the valve head design very, very small. You can really see here. Now, F20C, see how narrow it is compared with the much larger F20B block and the H22 block. So it's hard to believe that these two are actually related. Why was Honda so obsessed with making the engine as compact as possible? Now, if you look at where the engine is placed, this strut bar, which is not standard by the way, is where the top of the upper mounts sit. And usually on FR cars like the Roadster or the Alteza, the front of the engine block kind of comes up to here. But in the S2000, it's actually sitting well behind the line of the front, of the front suspension, giving the static weight distribution or mass distribution of 50-50. Now there's a little misconception about why cars or sports cars should have 50-50 weight distribution. Now this is of course ideal as marketing material um, stupefies that just having 50-50 weight distribution is really good for handling but of course it's more complicated than that. when a car accelerates or brakes it transfers weight uh, from the front wheels to the rear wheels. So that's not what it's about. You can have a high pull-off moment where you have weight on the wrong side of the car. But what Honda engineers have done was to achieve their 50-50 by pushing all the weight inside of the wheelbase, which is why the engine 
is as far back as possible and the front wheels are pushed way forward and you can see here the front has basically all the lightweight parts like the air box and the radiator here in fact there's a lot of space and you can see the stabilizer bar and if you remove this there's there's basically not much weight uh, the rear has the very strong rollover hoops here the spare tire sits underneath and the electric folding top and so somehow this manages to get a 50 50 weight distribution along with the big meaty subframe but that means all of the weight is actually pushed inside this narrow wheelbase which is one of the secrets of why the s2000 can handle a much more uh, sharply than uh, a lot of its contemporaries. Now if you look carefully you can see that the engine is actually tilted about 15 to 20 degrees towards this side meaning that it can sit lower in the drivetrain the exhaust is on this side and the intake is on this side. Now interestingly a lot of other manufacturers cars I have it reversed but Honda engines uh, rotate in a reverse direction actually the K28 then goes back to the normal direction but uh, this is the same direction as the B series and the H series over there. As we mentioned before in the integral video, uh, the engine is sitting on the right side and the gearbox is sitting on the left side. So just imagine taking this configuration and throwing it into an FR. So that's quite quirky, but um, that's something that Honda has chosen to do because another important point is how weight is distributed also on the left and right of the car. So it's not just front and rear with weight distribution. Um, Honda's been very well known to weight balance their car and corner weights that are almost equal with one driver sitting in the seat. So they perhaps considered the layout of components around the engine bay and around the car as well. And this is just something that they're very, very meticulous about. The f 20 c engine also features a lot of technologies that were developed after their experience with the H22 and the B18C uh, made specially for the F20C in order to achieve that high output uh, the intake manifold uh, was changed in volume and made more straight in the intake design very similar to the Type R so that's coming from um, the Type R experience and technology as well uh, on the AP1 throttle body is still operated by cable and on the AP2 became electric so there's minor changes here and there. A lot of the base technologies such as the, as the roller rocker arms, crankshaft design were then later used on the a very popular K20A engine but still that engine only outputs 225 horsepower maximum on the FD2 Type R. Still nothing beats this 250 horsepower from the 2 liter F20C. The F22 had slightly less horsepower but had more torque um, that's also something remarkable about uh, such a high output engine in 1999. Uh, it achieved the emission standards for the year 2000. It was awarded two stars by the Japanese standard. So um, it was something that Honda were very proud of. That they managed to achieve a very high specific output per liter for a naturally aspirated engine, which is actually quite hard without the turbocharger, but yet achieve emissions clean enough for Europe and America. What I personally like um, as a sports car enthusiast and also um, been following Honda for a long time is that the flexibility of the engine's power band compared to other 2-litre engines of that class it had more than enough torque but when the high cam switches over not VTEC kicks in <laughs> uh, technically we call it when it switches over to the high cams it really gives that surge of power that isn't overpowering all that power is sent through a very uniquely designed gearbox this is the honda design bespoke gearbox the six speed looks like it's just a normal conventional six speed transmission uh, with the six six speed six gears laid out and you have the uh, top shaft here. and already this looks very very different the diagram over here describes that this is how a conventional fr gearbox is laid out you have all the six gears and the reverse gear in the same unit the secondary final drive that's separate from the six gears reduces the number of idle gears. So it means that when the driver does a hard full throttle shift, it reduces the load on, on the gear change, which makes it smoother 
and also it decreases the amount of vibration that's going through the gear, the drivetrain. So that's just some of the few things that they've done uh, in order to uh, just realize their concept of the highest technology. Now the S2000 comes with its own unique key design. This one's a bit scuffed up, of course, it's already 20 years old. But just looking and touching the, all of this soft and but high quality materials, something very typical of Honda from the 90s. In fact, even the smell uh, smells, like my, smells like my Civic. Let's have a look at the cockpit area. You can see how it's extremely driver focused. And you have the aircon vents here, just for the driver. Um, the passenger only gets one on this side. And inbuilt are the aircon controls over here, big buttons. And on this side, you have an engine start button, which is one of the first um, in a Japanese production car. And these big buttons here are for the audio controls, which is supposed to be linked to the original stereo system, which, by the way, sits behind this little panel originally, but our elbows put in uh, DEFI one DIN gauges uh, because for the JDM version, this is very different from the export versions. Only the JDM version has got this. This is the optional two DIN, well not exactly two DIN, and you can see in his video he explains about uh, the fitment of an aftermarket navigation system. But this is the most, perhaps the most interesting thing about the Honda S2000 dash console. Look at that. Now the instrument cluster is completely digital. In fact, today it looks very dated, but it was very, very you know, high tech uh, back in 1999. But the funny thing is that this is not the first time that Honda or other manufacturers tried something digital. In the 80s, you had a lot of cars, like even the optional um, digital meters for the Supra and for the 86 that had something like this. But this particular layout is derived directly from Honda's F1 car, the McLaren MP4-5, and it's meant to give that F1 racing feeling. In fact, the entire fascia design of the top uh, of the dashboard and these things here, and even this line that comes onto the passenger side, but not on the driver's side, is meant to resemble the cockpit of that particular McLaren MP4-5 car. Now compared to the Mazda MX-5, gear shift position is a little bit high, maybe more upright. And here you have the hazard light button. I really wish it was on the center console, but you kind of get used to it. Here's the operation for the electric roof. And it takes just six seconds to close. But you have to be parked with the handbrake up to operate this. Um, obviously, add some weight. What's not so good about the interior is that there's practically no space to put anything. There are no door pockets. Um, there's only one cup holder. If you were to put your cup holder, you would be blocking the gear shift. So you finish your drink before you go driving. Um, this uh, armrest doesn't open, but you do get a little cubby space over here. The trunk opener electric button is here and this is supposed to open there's not a space here but it's now inconveniently blocked by this um, Cusco strut bar and you do have some complementary space behind here but if you're like me you sit a bit forwards maybe you can put your handbag uh, the passenger does get a little basket here and amazingly there are no there is there isn't a glove box at all so the S2000 um, designers probably intended you not to carry anything. Um, just get in the car, drive. But um, the trunk is actually of a good size. Let's have a look. So if you were to take your S2000 for a day trip, you've got enough space to put lots of bags. And moving this, Legends Media, complimentary of uh, Dustin Williams. Shout out to you, he's also bought an S2000. Oh, there's also a rear strut bar, which is not standard on Elbow's car. Now, there's supposed to be a trim a panel here, but because of the installation of the roll cage, as you can see, it goes all the way to the floor. The, there's no more space for the spare tire, which is supposed to fit in here. So I suppose this could be extra space for bags. Why not? You know? <laughs> for a day trip, it's really no problem uh, in the Honda S2000 at all. Hey guys, it's Albo again, and I'm here with my new car. And uh, you might be wondering why I'm wearing a cowboy hat. 
uh, I'm wondering as well. You might have seen my car in a previous video on GDA Masters with the Forester SDI. And while that was one dream car, this is the other dream car that I've had in my head for like the past 10 years and I'm finally able to own it and I love it. And let me tell you why. This is my new Miata, I mean my new S2000. And guys, I, I love this car. Uh, you know, coming from a Miata, my NA Roadster, this is basically that car, just like the Super Saiyan version of it. I mean, just looking at it, I love the lines. This is a car that I've loved and wanted to own since Gran Turismo 2, you know, like 15 years ago when I was playing that game on the PlayStation 2, the PlayStation 1. And this car for me just kind of embodies the PlayStation generation, which I'm from, in a car. And so that's why it really is a dream car. And what I'm so happy about is the fact that it really lived up to my expectations. I was kind of imagining a motorcycle on four wheels and with the 9,000 RPM Redline, that's exactly what this is. It's such a joy to drive. And I love how it's got that Honda reliability and build quality. Everything feels really well put together, even though this car is uh, model year 2000. So it's a 20 year old car, but it feels like you could buy it today. You could roll up to the showroom uh, at Honda and you could buy one of these today because it's, it's just that good. And I'm extremely delighted to own this car. So in previous videos, I've described this car with the word sublime. And you know, I like how it's an S word. So I was trying to think of other superlative words that could be used for this car, like supreme or, or uh, sexy. The word that probably best describes this car is Super Saiyan because this is pretty much the Super Saiyan version of my previous car. It's like a hero car for me. Some people might not like the, the super high uh, revving nature of it. Maybe they want more low end torque, but I, I love the driving experience as it just keeps building, building, building. Just like in, in Dragon Ball Z, would, you know, the, the more angry that he gets, the more power uh, he builds. So this is, that's why this car for me is a, is a Super Saiyan car. So hope you guys uh, enjoy watching my videos with this car on my channel. Uh, just search Albo. I'm sure it's the only channel you're gonna find and yeah, I love this car. It's, it's, it's a dream car. So in conclusion, the Honda S2000 still remains unique in its market placement. I don't think there's been any other car that would equally rival the Honda S2000 in its approach to the unique technologies and its performance. The MX-5 uh, was never really meant to be a true rival to it. It had lower power, uh, was also easier to drive. The Honda S2000 is very sharp handling and it's unlike most traditional FRs uh, in the way it moves and with its high revving engine it really demands a good driver. Some people say that it, it chooses its driver but also the maintenance cost uh, is a bit high and demands very good oil for example you need to take care of certain parts and these cars are now coming close to 10 to almost 20 years old and finding one in good condition, uh, perhaps you need to be uh, very well prepared uh, to own one of these fine machines. But still, uh, it's iconic in that sense that it can still rival uh, the performance of cars even today with its analog and very, very mechanical drivetrain without any electronic gimmicks or, or traction control or whatsoever. It remains a very pure and spartan drive. So that's our review of the JDM AP1 and leave us some comments if you would like us to find our other versions and talk about more about like the VTEC and I'll also I'll be talking about more technologies and also reviewing uh, some atomic cars related to the Honda 2000 in my channel next time so be sure to watch that and that's all from us peace out